Look, if anybody asks, this was totally intentional. Hello, my name is Margo Dedell, and I failed. Yep, it is that time of the month where I talk about my reading for May and roll for June. And uh, May was not at all how I expected it was going to go. You may recall, if you watched my May roll for TPR, I was so excited. I was like, man, the Dice Gods have shown me so much kindness. Everything is either a review book or a monster romance. Wonderful. This should be an easy end to my school year. Oh, oh, what a sweet summer child I was. Only those three and a half weeks ago, because very soon into the month, I realized that it wasn't gonna hack it for a variety of reasons. But this is the first month that I have just straight up completely failed, completely biffed it, meaning that not only did I not read all of the books as set for the prompts that I picked in that video, I also didn't switch them out for books that would also match those prompts. I did not get either a nat or a dirty win. So I am going to be rolling straight. Now, the good news is, is that I did get enough review books read to at least roll once. Uh, as it currently stands, I have four review books read. I am filming this kind of early in the month of May, so I probably could still get one more. I doubt I'll get two. Maybe if I'm like really, really feeling it and I get the six and I really, really want to re-roll something specifically, I might. But for right now, we're just going to go with the one re-roll. But in general, I guess I kind of should have seen it coming. I think I overhyped that last TBR. And if you've never worked in a school, um, the last few weeks of the school year is really, really tough. Specifically, like, three weeks out from the end of the school year because the kids have already started shutting off their brains. <laughs> They've already started, like, oh, we see summer break. We're already talking about plans. They're already checking out. But you can't have the last three weeks of school just be nothing. You do still have to do schoolwork. So you're trying to get kids that have already switched their brains to summer break mode to do school. It's, it's very tricky. <laughs> but uh, I also had a lot of traveling in May. We had several weekends back to back where the entire weekend was spent at uh, family birthday parties or um, other events Mother's Day, like that kind of stuff. So I lost a lot of that precious weekend time that I often use to catch up. So it just wasn't great. And I will go into some of the books and why some of the books actually didn't help me, even though I thought it would. But let's jump into the few books off my DBR I did read in May. First up, I read Academy Arcanist by Shami Stovall. This was at the top of my list. I loved the parent series to this, The Frith Chronicles, so I knew I was probably going to like this one, and I was correct. This is a, a flintlock fantasy YA series taking place, give or take, about 50 years after the end of The Frith Chronicles, and it follows a young kid as he is plagued by nightmares that leave him injured in the real world, and he has to become an Arcanist to go to this uh, Astra Academy for Arcanists to kind of figure out what's going on with him and save himself. And uh, I, I was really interested by that. And I jumped into this one already knowing a lot about the world, but also knowing that this might be the first book um, that a lot of people see in this universe. So I was kind of thinking about that as I read it for the review. And uh, yes, there are cameos from characters in that previous series and vague references to the big wars that happened in that previous series. Nothing too spoilery apart from one specific thing, but I can't even explain why it's spoilery without spoiling it. But it's not like the like characters aren't just dropping dialogue that spoils things. Um, it's just seeing certain characters at all with their Eldrin, like you start putting two and two together if you're reading the previous one. But beyond that, a great starting pick for anyone wanting to get into this series. Um, I don't even like magic schools all that much, but I liked the characters and I liked the growing um, discussion around classism we're gonna be talking about in this because uh, Gray's class seems to be mostly made of uh, basic um, 
like poorer kids that needed help becoming arcanists and super rich kids that had like nobility and and tutors and stuff um so i like that dynamic that's gonna be a lot different than a lot of the dynamics we saw in the previous ones where most of the kids were from poorer backgrounds um but in general i am excited to do the next one and i also am also really impressed that shammy managed to get this one marketed and out without spoiling anything because the first book in the fifth chronicles very blatantly spoiled the big twist because it was the only way uh, she could get people to like buy into the marketing and buy it. She even told me she had originally had a different synopsis that kept the secret and it wasn't selling as well. But this one, she only has a reputation that she can just hold the secret. So I'm not even going to tell you what kind of Arcanist Grey becomes. I love the kind of Arcanist he becomes. I love his Eldrin and I definitely will be spoiling it in future books because I got to. But in this one, great pick. Loved going back to this universe and I can't wait until Shami sends me the next one because you're sending me the next one, right, Shami? <laughs> Up next, we had Cinder Beast by Lilith K. Duat. This is a joint Cinderella and Beauty and the Beast retelling with a monster romance. And if you've been around my channel, you know I love me a monster romance, so I was all for it. It follows the 20-something Ellie who works in a brothel, but like as a maid. And she uh, is your usual Cinderella insert, very, you know, put down upon by her stepmother. Um, a lot of suicide ideation in this one. Uh, it literally begins with it, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, but there is a ball with the prince and she goes and she meets the prince it's a meet cute they're canoodling in the gardens and then suddenly the prince is the one that has to run away by midnight i like that part and she more suicide ideation and runs through the woods the old garden rather blindly and stumbles across this strange beast i wonder like okay yeah we all know but like just pretend um and then she ends up staying in the palace so we kind of start with the cinderella and then move to the beauty and the beast and uh i like the general idea but however the execution was fairly flawed for me personally. Um, there were some moments where the book didn't manage to find the middle ground between the retellings. Uh, for example, in Cinderella, the prince is very famously noticeable and, and sought after and everyone sees his face and knows him. And in Beauty and the Beast, it is very famously the opposite. The prince is basically forgotten. Most people don't even know there is a prince in a castle hanging around nearby. So trying to find the middle ground of that, it made it a little bit muddy because it opened a lot of plot holes that the two stories did not have previously because you have a prince that has a fully stocked and staffed palace one day of the year and is seen one day of the year and then is completely absent the rest. But also like still has the legal records and like sk still keeps track of that stuff. So it's like, okay, is this a fully working monarchy or isn't it? Um, there were also some issues with the transition between the two stories because... It doesn't do a great job of setting up why Ellie stays, uh, at least not up front. There was a lot of missing upfront exposition on explaining the world. Um, and I know that people often talk down about exposition, but sometimes you just have to do it to explain things. And there were a lot of things that were explained way late in the book after the fact, after I'd already just accepted that they weren't going to be explained. So they felt very late game. Um, and in general, a little bit of the writing style, I, I ended up having to rate this one pretty low. I don't usually rate books two stars, but this one, um, I might have overhyped it in my head a little bit, to be honest. I don't get a lot of monster romance review requests. I get excited. Uh, but I would still suggest anyone who loves fairy tale retellings to check this one out. It just necessarily wasn't the best pick for me. Surrendering to Scylla by Ren K. Morris. I was really excited for this one because it was one of the rare monster romances where the woman was the monster and the man was the human and he was such an adorable golden retriever boyfriend. Loved that. I also loved Scylla who uh, you actually see become the monster of the Greek legend um, and, and is very monstrous in form. And of course we had tentacles and yes, I know you're wondering, Margaret, do the tentacles come up in the sexy scenes? Yes, they do. Yes, go forth <laughs> with the, the tentacles and the sexy scenes. But I was liking it for the most part. There was a late stage plot decisions that seemed completely out of line for me. And I can't explain them, obviously, without spoiling anything. But it was like, you had a great vibe, great vibe. And then the vibe kind of got weird. And those last couple plot decisions, I was just kind of eh about I think I did I give this four or three stars 
now I can't remember. Um, this wasn't a review book, so sometimes my non-review books flutter out of my head a little bit faster. But uh, still a good pick, especially because it is one of the few books that uh, has the uh, woman as the monster. And it talks a lot about feminine rage and being very justified in your feminine rage because no one was more screwed over in, in all, and I, I will hold this, no one was screwed over more in all of Greek mythology than Scylla, unless like maybe you're talking about like the, the other dryads that were turned into trees and stuff. <laughs> but um, I will still look into more from this author. Um, I don't remember if this is the beginning of a series. It might be. Very few things aren't series anymore these days, um, but I was happy to get another monster book on my list. Enthralled by Tiffany Roberts. This is the one I put off for over a year because I knew it was going to be high stakes and I was right, although not in the way I thought I was. This is the sequel to Ensnared and it is our uh, sexy spider alien story. You've probably seen this around even just as a there's a book like this. It's actually really sweet with a really incredible world building. Um, I honestly kind of get upset that it just gets thrown around as the it's a spider. Like no it's more than that. Uh, but this I can't say a lot because spoilers, but uh, the book actually didn't have the drama I was afraid it would have, or I guess that I was nervous about having to read about until the very end. It was actually pretty tame, not the severity I was expecting until the end. And then I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> like the last give or take 20 pages, it goes dark and so dire to the extent that in the author's note right after the end it starts with an apology <laughs> it starts with the author pair because it's married duo apologizing to the reader like that level of cliffhanger um so I probably won't be able to wait a year it'll probably make me anxious to wait a year to get to it but I loved this one I am happy that it is as good as I was hoping it would be because I loved the first one um, I was even warning my friend Laura because she'd started this one and then I had to like pause it and I was like be prepared be prepared for the ending <laughs> Ooh, that was it was deep I also like it though because this one um we started seeing hints of queer relationships and Thank you. Yes, yes, the spider alien warrior deserves her spider alien warrior girlfriend. Thank you. Yes, winning. But anyways, I gotta get to the next one. <laughs> Up next was my temporary DNF, The Dreams That Bind Us by Maximilian Lopez. This is a sci-fi thriller all about a trio of people who, when they go to sleep, are basically transported to an alternate dimension, therefore they never really sleep. And uh, I started reading it, but then like five or six pages in, something in the writing style it was already feeling like I was having to like force myself to get through it and and for five or six pages in that's kind of early for that to happen um however uh since it is a review book it has an extra layer of let's call it protection against DNFing um so I am going to just temporarily put it aside for now and try to come back to it later um I will occasionally DNF review books. It is very rare for that to happen. Usually it means that it is very likely for that book to become a one star and I'm just not enjoying the reading it at all. And I would rather just not force myself to read it just to give a one star review. I would rather just end it there. Um, but I am going to give this one a second chance later on in the summer when my brain is much more relaxed from summer break. Um, however, when I went to go see what else I could replace it with, because the prompt for this one was science fiction, I realized I didn't really have a lot of other science fiction that I felt compelled to read, aside from, you know, the last book in that space opera series that I'm still not prepared. <laughs> I'm still not prepared to end. Uh, so that's kind of the moment where I was like, okay, we probably just won't win. That's fine. Uh, we'll just do a straight roll this time. Um, so I will try this again later. I don't know if I'll put it on another TBR again, just in case, because uh, I don't want to insult the author by repeatedly posting videos about how I DNF things. Uh, so yeah, that's the moment where we realized eh, we weren't going to win this month. Up next was the uh, Forever DNF that made me take the entire series off my series spreadsheet, and that is Dark's Savior by Olivia Riley. Uh, this was the sequel to Heart's Prisoner, and I adored Heart's Prisoner. Loved it, have reread parts of it several times, and so I was excited for this one that features a group of humans who uh, accidentally stumbled into the alien universe and are quote unquote taken under the wing of, of the alien empire and are left on this mining planet while the alien empire basically figures out what they're going to do with them. And our protagonist stumbles down deep into mines and stumbles across, you know, the sexy alien she ends up with. 
I loved the concept, um, but then it did the thing. The thing that so many alien romances specifically love to do, and that is just casually tossing in human sex trafficking. If you don't read a lot of alien romances, it's hard to explain just how much sex trafficking comes up in those books. It is a mainstay and very often will just suddenly become a plot point late game book without any trigger warnings or warnings whatsoever. And I get why, because they don't want to spoil things, but also I don't want to read that. I'm, I'm over it. We can find other reasons and other ways of getting humans and aliens to meet that don't involve real world horrific trauma based crimes. And I held on to this because the uh, late game plot twist happened like 50 pages from the end. And I was like, oh, well, maybe I can just finish it, just force myself through. But like freaking they they even had them like wearing red cloak type stuff like it was Handmaid's Tale. Like I was so over it. Like no, I wanted a fun alien romance because like the previous book didn't have it at all. <laughs> so I'm like, why is it here? Uh, so when I fully decided that, you know what, I'm just not going to win. I don't care. I DNF'd it. I deleted the book entirely. I kept the first book in the series because I do, again, I like rereading it. But I went to my spreadsheet and I deleted the series off. I'm not going to continue it. I don't trust authors when this kind of thing happens. Like, if you are suddenly surprising me with that kind of stuff un unlabeled in a book, it immediately makes me want to buy anything from that author less because now I can't trust you. I can't trust anything that's in that book. I can't trust that there isn't going to be some late game thing that I didn't want to read that you didn't bother warning me for. So we're just going to be done with Olivia Riley for a while unless I can find reviews that tell me for a fact what is and is not in the book. I am just I'm so over the fact that a, a series that is primarily written by women also features so many crimes against women. Make it make sense. And lastly, The Surprise, Smoke and Hellfire by Kristen Brandt. This was my TBR vet. It was the last review book I had accepted in 2022 and I put it off for, I don't know, reasons. But then when I actually started reading it, I was like, oh, hey, wait, <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> this is a kind of like almost like a paranormal short story collection focusing on this young witch named Maggie uh, who yes did remind me much of myself becoming best friends with an exorcist named Bea and each of the short stories told in chronological order um, follows their exploits as they are helping people with demons and the fae and evil spirits and all that kind of stuff. Um, there was great tension. It is told from the point of view of Maggie as if she is writing a uh, memoir or a biography of their exploits. I love the sense of tension that was in it from the beginning because uh, early on in the book, like the first part of it, um, we know something's happened to Bea that Maggie is writing these memoirs, other exploits, in response to some big thing that has happened to Bea in her world, but you don't know what it is. There's also a lot of secrets around who Bea is, what she is, what she can do, why she can do what she can do, and um, you don't get a lot of answers to it because this is a series, but this book is also very short. Uh, the copy I had was 144 pages, but the text was pretty dense. So it, it might be longer if the formatting is different. I'm not sure. Um, but I was honestly blown away by how much I loved it. And not just because Maggie is the, you know, long skirt cottage court girly that reminded me so much of myself. Like at one point she literally pulls out a tea bag because she just carries a tea bag on her person because you never know when emergency tea will be needed. And you know what? Valid. She's so right for that. <laughs> regardless I am really excited to continue on with that series I will have that review and all of the reviews for at least you know the books I actually reviewed down in the description below if you want a more in-depth look into my thoughts on those also yes I did not even begin these Gossamer Strings by Allegra Pescatore. Did I promise myself I wasn't going to put the third book in this trilogy off? Yes, I did. Is it still a high fantasy trilogy with a lot of shit that's going to be going down and I'm scared? Also, yes, it's fine. The author understands. I'll just keep being a coward. Let's move on. 
All right, it is time to roll for June. I will not have any modifiers. I will not be rolling with advantage. I have one re-roll and I gotta make sure to check as I roll if I want to re-roll things. Uh, but also I am going to be participating in the uh, Treasure Island round of Once Upon a Readathon, which thankfully does not have any significant uh, list of prompts. It's just you get slightly more points if the book is queer or BIPOC or um, has certain creatures on the cover, which those are easy enough to fit in. So I'm not going to bend over backwards too far to try to fit books specifically for that readathon. I am still going to try to put a lot of review books on there because while I did read more than I have in previous months, I, I still need to pick it up. All right, let's go for roll one. Okay. All right, the number seven goes with the prompt, a physical book. I don't get this one a lot, but I picked House of Hunger by Alexis Henderson. I picked this one up in a teeny tiny little bookshop in the town my parents live in. Like seriously, I don't think five people could stand in that shop together. Um, but this is all about a young woman who is living in the slums with all of the problems that come with that. And she sees an ad for a blood maid to go live among the nobility in the North. And she's like, okay, that's money, let's go. And she ends up pulled into this kind of house of debauchery, the dark underground court with this mysterious and alluring countess that is in charge of all of it. And she is pulled in and she, you know, must learn the ropes before it becomes her grave and all that kind of dramatic uh, vampire stuff. Um, I've seen this author's other work, uh, The Year of the Witching, talked about a lot, but I have not read that one. Uh, this is just the one I stumbled across, and I believe it is sapphic, which means I am all for it. And it's been a while since I've had a nice, uh, creepy vampire story. Well, I take that back. I actually read Interview with the Vampire not long ago, but this one, I'm hoping, doesn't have the creepy five-year-old vampire child. Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it should be a nice spooky pick. And let's go for roll two. Okay. Eight is for the prompt 400 plus pages, meaning a book that is at least 400 pages or more. And for this one, I'm trying again. We're going to try it again. These Gossamer Strings by Allegra Pescatore. But then when I went to check, you know, because I was pretty sure it was longer than 400, but I wasn't sure how long it actually was. So I looked on the Goodreads and it's over 900 pages. That might be the absolute longest review book I've ever read. I think it might even be longer than the Shammy Stovall books I've read, because I'm pretty sure she topped out somewhere in the 800s. <sighs> Allegra. <laughs> um, but this is the third in its trilogy, and I can't explain anything that's going down, because it's all based on the ending of the first book, which is a little bit annoying, that so little happened in the second book and the third book is this long. <laughs> you couldn't make it like a quadrilogy. Okay, <laughs> but I'm gonna try. We're gonna try to get to this one and all of its drama of which I am expecting a lot, but I am still holding out hope that there will be a polycule at the end because the authors hinted in previous books and if there is the polycule I'm expecting then it will all be worth it. All right, I feel like the dice gods may not be super happy with me right now, but they don't seem particularly pissed. Let's try for roll three. Oh no, I lied, they're big mad. We're good, we're good. I thought it was a one, it's, it's not, it's a seven. So it's another physical book. And for that, I am going with The Penwith Curse by Katherine Coulter. This book was originally intended for a video that I actually never ended up going through with, where I like, found these old books that I had read over a decade ago and like had to like search online for them to even remember what the title and authors were and read them but it just it wasn't as amazing and tension filled as I was expecting so I'm like eh, screw it but I had already bought this one and this one is particularly notable for me because it was the very first book I'd ever read that had a sex scene in it and that was a big deal for me because I was I believe 14 or younger and I was actually on a, a mission trip with the church pastor's kid and I had found this in like a charity shop type thrifting sorting place we were working in and we were allowed to like take any of the leftover stuff and I grabbed this one and I just like so scandalized that I was reading a book with a sex scene um and I don't 
uh, remember all of the plot points, but I remember a very large amount of it. And it's about uh, this little like holding uh, fortress that supposedly has a curse from anyone that tries to overtake it. And this dude named Bishop who uh, is like in favor with the king is like, hey, I can make it work. I'll, you know, force the heiress to marry me and break the curse and whatever. And then, of course, things go weird and sideways and fantasy and there's uh, reincarnation involved from these older magical people. And it, it's very kitschy medieval romance. And in all honesty, there are probably some problematic parts that wouldn't, would not fly today, at least in a mainstream setting. Uh, again, from what I can remember, I got this one uh, used, thrifted, um, and I'm going to use it uh, actually for a pop sugar prompt now that I have it. But I'm figuring with the other books on my TBR, having a, a romance reread, even though I don't usually do rereads, would help. Um, it is very easy for me to justify this one, though, because it's not already on my Goodreads. <laughs> So like I haven't already read it on Goodreads, so it doesn't look like a reread on Goodreads and my Goodreads number will still go up, <laughs> which is very important. All right, let's see how roll four is gonna go. Okay. 19 is for the prompt, A Queer Author. And for this one, I went back to my review list and I picked Falling for the Mark by Dominique Davis. This is a sapphic contemporary romance about a mother-daughter duo that cons old men out of their many riches. The mother will uh, like have an actual relationship with the man and convince him to sign a prenup for marriage and stuff. And then the daughter will swoop in and seduce them and they'll get caught in the act and the prenup will be broken and the pair gets a lot of money out of it. Except their latest Mark has a daughter of his own and tension begins to rise, you know, sexually between said daughters and the daughter of the con artist decides that she might not want to do this anymore. And what happens if the secret is revealed? All of that good angsty stuff. Um, it looks like it's just kind of more warm-hearted rom-com-y, at least as far as I can tell from the few reviews I glanced at and the cover and everything. Um, but that's fine. I got plenty of angst and hard-hitting stuff coming from other places on my TBR. This can be the nice fluffy stuff. And of course, I'm always here for sapphics being messy. And roll five. Ooh, hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, no. We're re-rolling that. I don't want to do that. Okay. So the prompt for two is classic. And the only classic I have currently is Les Mis. And if you know anything about that book, it is fucking gigantic. So we rolled, ended up with another 400 plus page book, still shorter than Les Mis though. So I still came out better for using the reroll, finally using a reroll. And I went with another review book and that is Soulscape by K.R. Stevenson. This is a very chunky Beauty and the Beast retelling all about a young woman who uh, washes up on the shore of this island, heavily injured and is healed, but then discovers that the people living on this island are very strange and fantastical creatures. And also her dad is there for, you know, stealing stuff. The standard and the standard, she decides to take his place for him. But as she is serving out her little prison sentence on here, she uh, finds out that there is an enemy coming at the island and being the prima pragmatic person that she is, she says, hey, I'll help you out. I'll help fight this enemy because, you know, if they attack the island, they're attacking me too. So uh, it's kind of Beauty and the Beast with an added uh, antagonistic element. And that is interesting to me. Um, it is <laughs> it's very much a thick boy. And it looks like, from what I can tell in the synopsis, the, the Beast Insert's curse is maybe a little bit darker than expected. Um, I'm really hoping I like this one. I'm really hoping that the the writing style reads quickly, because again, it, it's a chunky boy. Is it? Yeah, it's over 600. It's a really good thing I'm on summer break. <laughs> Um, but hopefully we can get this one read as well, because again, I need to get more review books out. I have been struggling. All right, roll six. Let's go. Why so many eights? Uh, a 400 plus page book. Again, 
Still shorter than Les Mis, though. So for this one, I went with Blood Circus by Camilla Victoire. This is one of the rare instances in which I have actually gone to BookBub to get a book. Usually I don't do that anymore. Uh, but this one looks like some kitschy, melodramatic YA fun. This takes place in a world where aliens have landed because, you know, the humans were humaning and the world was ending and they kind of like swooped in to save everything. But also, they're kind of really antagonistic towards humans. And our protagonist accidentally stumbles into like the alien zone, like crosses into their territory. And so she gets captured and is forced to participate in like their death games and also starts to realize that maybe what she learned about them isn't the truth, but also she's still participating in death games. So like, I don't know. I'm not expecting it to make a lot of sense. <laughs> the number one thing that I'm here for is the fact that uh, according to the author's bio, she worked with the circus, like an actual circus, and used the, the years she spent working with the circus to write this. So I want to see the circus influence from someone that actually like worked in one. That's what I want. That's what I'm here for. I don't expect this to be my favorite book. Um, I'm expecting it to <laughs> probably have a lot of weird decisions. Um, it is likened to both Hunger Games, which is obvious, but also Children of Blood and Bone, which seems okay. I, I don't necessarily get Children of Blood and Bone from that specific description. Uh, but I did read that one, so I might be able to figure it out. Uh, I have not read Hunger Games, but like I know the vibe. Everybody knows the vibe. And this one, I'm hoping, will again be a quick read. On Goodreads, it's actually 350 pages, but the one on my Kindle says 417. So we're going with that. It might be slightly less than 400, but the gist of the prompt is still there. We're going to read a longer book and hopefully have some of that great melodramatic YA. All right, roll seven. Awesome. 18 is a shifter romance. And this was weird. Usually I have a shifter romance on lock somewhere ready to pull out and read it at any given time. I didn't have one here to the extent that I was literally looking through my Goodreads because my Goodreads is formulated to be my entire owned TBR and I couldn't find one. What I did find were a couple books that should have gotten deleted but it weren't, but also two books that I had meant to unhaul and didn't. So I literally went through, unhauled two books to open a new slot in my TBR challenge and then went on the hunt for a new shift or romance. But this was also a challenge because I went back to my series spreadsheet. Okay, what's the next book in a shift or romance series? The only shift or romance series I'm currently working on, I'm all cut up to date with. I'm waiting on the next books to come out. So I went back to one of my favorite authors, which is Zoe Chant. But the problem is, is that Zoe Chant is an author collective and it can be touch and go for me depending on what Zoe I'm working with. And I didn't want to have to go to the fan page to look up what Zoe did what. And also a lot of the earlier works of the Zoe's I do like is under 200 pages and I'm not a big fan of romances under 200 pages. I know this is a very long spiel. I'm just very surprised that this specific genre, which I could have sworn was one of my favorites, I was so low on. So this might be moving on the prompts list or I might have to make a bigger point of adding more the next time the uh, TBR challenge is put on hold. But I finally, after going through recommendations on Amazon, found The Dragon Prince of Alaska by Elva Birch. This was actually one that Zoe Chant recommended through Amazon and it is all about this woman who uh, basically was blackmailed and had to flee for her life and ends up in the kingdom of Alaska because in this alternate universe Alaska is its own kingdom apparently and discovers a park ranger who tells her uh, he is both a prince and she is his fated mate and he must whisk her off to the palace but there are like people intrigue and trying to assassinate the royal family and stuff uh so it again seems very kitsch uh it's literally you know called the dragon prince of alaska which is just a great title in itself like that's the title that you would put in a book to demonstrate the kind of kitschy stuff that character likes to read a la stephen graham jones uh loved the book that he mentioned in the only good indians i wish those books actually existed <laughs> But regardless, uh, I'm hoping this one will be a quick read. It is just over 260 pages, which is kind of my sweet spot for shifter romances. But in general, either I've got to move this prompt around or I've got to get a whole lot more books. 
All right, last roll. Again, and lastly, another 400 page book. I think the Dice Gods were mad that I didn't like the really easy TBR I had last month and now it's the punishment. But this gives me the chance to try again at a book I tried to put on a TBR before, and that is The Unbroken by C.L. Clark. This is an African-inspired fantasy all about uh, two women who are caught on either sides of a political conflict. You have the uh, woman that was conscripted into the army as a child, a child soldier who doesn't really care about much, as well as the uh, young heir to the throne who is trying to overthrow her uncle to build a better world because, you know, said uncle is evil and a tyrant. You know, like uncles in fantasy stories almost always are. Uh, but of course they meet and our princess wants to use our child soldier uh, as a way to kind of keep the rebels at bay while she tries to overthrow her uncle from the inside because if the rebels win things are only going to get worse and she kind of wants to, you know, stop that. But then of course, romance sapphic romance uh, <laughs> it's a great month for sapphic romances from BIPOC authors for me <laughs> I'm loving this but regardless uh, I have heard fantastic things about this one but it is a chunker how many pages are we looking at here is it over 500 those are the extras it might be just shy of 500 okay a lot of a lot of pages this month but we'll get through it I wanted to read this one for a while I lucked out in finding it in a thrift store a while back and I knew I lucked out I just keep putting it off because again thick boy and high fantasy and we all know how well Margaret does with high fantasy so not gonna lie this month's TBR a little bit daunting genuinely feel like the dice gods are mad at me because they gave me such an easy TBR last month and apparently I wasn't grateful enough. But uh, I am on summer break. I don't work over the summer. Thankfully, I don't have to. However, that doesn't mean that my month is completely wide open. We do have stuff going on on the weekends, uh, family coming to visit late in the month, and <laughs> best of all, earlier in the month, I have to get my wisdom teeth out. I've never had to have any surgery ever, so I have no idea how my body is going to respond, but I'm ready for the headaches to be done. Uh, I am hoping that I'll just have the, you know, two to three days of being sleepy and then move on, but I am preparing for that dry socket weirdness just in case, so I might lose a full week. Who knows? Maybe I can use that time to read, or maybe I'll literally just be sleeping. I'm hopeful that I can get over it pretty quickly. Um, and yes, I do plan on, on reading a lot more anyways. But this is just half, half my TBR. I mean, if I don't win again, it's not a big deal. And uh, in general, I am excited for a lot of these books. I have discovered the more I go on is that I do really love longer books. I am turning into my father. Um, if you don't know, I've mentioned this before, but my father has a thing where um, he won't read a book under 400 pages if he has not already read and liked another book from that author. So I'm turning into him the older I get. But I also know that for a lot of speculative works, you need that extra page count to really flesh out the world. So who knows? Maybe I'll love this. Maybe maybe it'll be the complete opposite of last month where I get the really daunting and hard TBR and then rock it. No idea. But if you are interested in seeing how well I fare, feel free to subscribe and stick around. And we can see how badly I do. <laughs> Regardless, with nothing else to say, I hope you have a wonderful day and a marvelous tomorrow.